Okay. All right. So the first question, um, there's a lot of people talking about this pandemic as we're in unprecedented times. It's never happened before. And when Indigenous people hear that, especially our elders and our knowledge holders, <clears throat> that doesn't ring true because we have lots of experience with sickness from, uh, from colonialism yeah. and epidemics and pandemics. So what is, what is that Dene experience that, uh, that you have about um, epidemics and pandemics? How much time we have? Live as long as you want. <laughs> oh, maybe you should introduce yourself too. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Sorry about that. I skipped, I skipped ahead. All right. Let me know when to start. Okay, go. Good. Okay. Uh, good, good day. Good afternoon. My name is Fred Sangres. I'm a member of the Yellow Knives Denny First Nation in Northern Great Slave Lake. Uh, I'm Indigenous and uh, Treaty 8. I was born here in this area 63 years ago, and I still reside in my home area. I'm going to be talking about a bit of history of uh, sickness and pandemic over the past centuries uh, known to our people in the far north. And as, a, as a, an elder, I was raised in a village to a nomadic family. My parents were nomadic. My grandfather was still using bow and arrow when I was just a little child. And my family didn't speak any English at all. So I grew up in, in a very nomadic uh, lifestyle. I understand the language. So when our elders and people get together, they tell, tell stories, I, I'm always there. I'm hearing, I'm listening, I'm picking up the stories. And I have a good memory of all the, the stories of the past. When something impacts you and affects you greatly, you and is told, you have a great memory of it. You can never forget it. And it's for me, it's embedded in my mind and that uh, I live with that almost every day. I never tell stories about it, but I, I would like to tell this story about it, the sickness and the, and the epidemic that's happening with us in the past history from colonial settlements from the very beginning when their first priests arrived in our country here. And that's where things have started. I want to begin by saying that all of North America from south to north is the original indigenous homeland of indigenous people. This is the only world that they know. They know no other countries no other islands around, this is their home. And since it's been our home, there has been many uh, discoveries of our people, indigenous people in North America. And when the first uh, European settled, walked on the shore, no one ever thought that that first step would probably have a big impact on the millions and millions of indigenous people that live in this country, North America, that they call home. That first step on the shore uh, uh, was the beginning of intrusion of colonial and it's very long history right to right to this day here. And as I can tell you that indigenous stories are not limited. Indigenous stories are told almost every day at camps, at places, at gatherings, everywhere, young and old. So we hear it all the time. One of the stories I, I heard was the 1928 epidemic and my own father and grandfather, who were the only two survivors of that whole family, have told the stories. And many of the elders in my village, whose numbers were almost over 7,000 people, and within 20 years or so, came down to only a few hundred handful and all those people have passed away. And I'm gonna tell my story. <coughs> As my grandfather said, when the first man arrived here, the black robe, the man dressed in black, all black, come preaching to our people, trying to tell our people that right, the right way to live, the right way to go with God. 
at that time they were trying to get as many flock, I guess, many people under their wings. You know, there's Catholic, there was uh, Anglican, Protestant, there's many other priests and ministers that want to get Aboriginal people under their wing. But my grandfather was one of those people who did not trust the, the man in black because he was a spiritual uh, person. He was almost like a psychic. He could tell a person what the person's goal is, what's the person's intention is. And my grandfather feeling was that that man in black was there to preach, but he was working for somebody else. And his goal was to get the people, Denny people, to uh, pray his way and live his way of life and change our way of life uh, for the coming of other people that will follow them. In our history, the Canadian government followed the priests of North. And that's how I think the very first colonial settlement here was uh, forfeiting and uh, getting, getting rid of our own religion, our own way of thinking in our own world. And we have a way of connecting with the creator. We have a way of uh, healing our people. We have a way of living. We have our own laws. Many of them have been broken by people that arrive here. I don't blame the people in, in, in dressed in a black robe, but I do believe in what my grandfather told me and that their intentions may not have been good because behind them was a men of Ottawa that came here and tried to take our land, take our land that we have indigenous title on and trick the indigenous people into handing over their land in returning for a few promises that were never delivered. To this day, indigenous people all over North America, I believe, are feeling that hurt, mistrust. And I, too, as an elder, I have that same feeling as my grandfather did. So around 1850s, uh, my grandfather was born uh, on uh, Cockman River near Great Bear Lake in the far north, northeast of Great Bear Lake on a long portage called Huate. Huate means uh, the long portage. And uh, he was born there 1865 into a very, very nomadic uh, family. They were very spir uh, spiritual, they were very kind, and uh, didn't live a very, very violent life. They lived a very peaceful life with their neighbors in this country. And what they believe and how they live is what they believe is their right way. That they were living on their land living uh, from the resources that the Creator provided to them, and that they were free to travel without question from anybody to do what they want. And they were free people. They had language, they had cultural, they had society, and above all, they had indigenous title to their lands, which Canada forfeited and took people and taking that land away. So I always ask the question to Canada, how did you acquire this land legally? Show me the documents that you have, you have been sold this land. I don't think so. They provide, they want to come to a table and negotiate. They know they're wrong. They know they lied. They know it was all bad. They rather negotiate, but negotiations are never what the indigenous people intention, what they want. It's always a, a small handful of gifts and this and that, but never the real meaning of uh, recognition as indigenous people. About 1850, when uh, the priests arrived here, they were, from the stories I heard from my own family, my grandfather in 1976 was 107 years old. Other people in my village say that my grandfather was probably the oldest, as old as 120 years. So through his stories and what he saw is what I'm going to share with you. When the priests arrived here, they were trying to get the people to learn how to pray, how to uh, work around 
uh, about worship, about altar, about uh, the God. The Dene people, I believe here, already had a spiritual connection with God. They already had a creator. They already believed that this whole earth and the universal and everything that is beautiful was created by the creator and that there is a person who is the creator of all. And that's who we worship through our drums, our songs, our gatherings, everything. And it is it always been there. When the missionaries arrived here, they didn't understand that. They thought everything we done was bad. They got they got the help of Ottawa to ban many of our religious ceremonies. And because of that, many indigenous people have lost their religious belief, their culture, and they are lost in their own homeland all across North America. Look at every city's towns, you see them in the streets. It's, it's what's been done. Their, their life and style has been forfeited into something that was new to them and they were told to live that way when their own way of living was, was okay and there was nothing wrong with it. I think Canada really wanted to change people. The way I see it, when Canada, uh, Canadian people came up north, start to engage and talk to people about their lands, about the environment, about their way of life, the big part of it, all of it, was racism. A lot of it was prejudice. A lot of it was uh, a view that they were superior and that the indigenous people were not. But look at indigenous people today. They are very intelligent, very spiritual, and very human, as like any other people. And as indigenous people, they are not violent people. They are good people. And I think under the creator's hand, the indigenous people probably sit on the right hand of the creator because they are the ones who've been abused the most and probably been uh, challenged by the newcomers, the colonial settlers that came into this land. So the epidemic in about 1850, small parts of it started. Indigenous people were not immune to disease, cold, smallpox, and many other things that Europeans that came to this country that brought with them. Uh, around 1850, uh, people did die. They were not immune to, to the colonial settlers, such as cold and many other things that came. But it wasn't big. It was, it was small, I believe, at the beginning. People did die. People did lose their life, and there was no medicine here at that time. So at, uh, the worst ones were probably uh, start to realize was probably about 1890, 1900, when many, many uh, diseases start to come up with the discovery of gold in the Yukon and discovery of gold in the North and uh, made many, many of uh, prospectors many of whom are non aboriginal people, uh, Canadians who came up here. Uh, I, I would call them uh, British subjects because that's under the crown, that's what they are. And they came up and uh, looked for gold. And when they did, they brought their own disease and cold and many other things. People did affect, get affected. By 1925, 26, 1927 was probably the worst case here. And from the stories I heard, that probably brought uh, tears to my eyes when I hear it, is that it was, it was horrible. It was anywhere from 14 to 20 people dying each day at various camps in the villages in my background by, by Dera in the city of Yellowknife, east, west, south. Wherever the Dene people had their tents or were living off the land, there were people dying. And uh, an elder named uh, Alexei Potfighter uh, was a young man at that time, was very fortunate not to have caught any of that disease. He had cloth, I believe, he was wearing, and he was burying people, 10, 15 people, almost every day. So much that it, it affected his life for the, his whole lifetime. Well, he told me one time, when I look in a distance, he said, all I see is the burials, all I see is these people dying. 
and I still have good memory of it, he said. So even at his old age, when he passed away, you know, he still had that grief in him. But from that uh, 1928 epidemic, it was, it was horrible. It was very horrible. Yelnev's Dene, my tribe, was probably about uh, a little over 7,000 people all over the land. My people went to the Arctic coast to Fort Churchill, uh, Prince of Wales Churchill. They went to Bathurst and left to the coast. They went to Great Slave Lake, Great Bear Lake, Cockmine Rivers. They went south, Detcho. Because there were so many people, they went all over the land. They were occupying the land. They had title to it. They, had, they, were, they were, had sovereignty. They were free to do whatever they please on their land. And that's how they governed themselves. They look after themselves. But the epidemic that came here really devastated them. And uh, it was after uh, July 1900, there was treaty, treaty aid was made in Fort Resolution. That treaty and many of the uh, elders here uh, all over who testified in Thomas Berger uh, inquiry in 1974, all say that the treaty was peace and friendship. It was not for the uh, selling of land or giving up of land. No indigenous person in their right mind will ever give up their land. They have title to it. They would never sell it unless it was coercion, unless they were tricked into it. And that, that's how we're probably Canada acquired the land. Today, I think they got caught in their negotiating land claims because of that. And uh, uh, apology is probably a big part of it. But going back to uh, 19... 28 epidemic. Uh, it was very sad, sad. Some of the surviving uh, elders I talked to, because uh, as, a, as a young man, I was always outspoken. I was always interested in the elder story, interested in what they know. I wanted to carry it on for the future. So I tried to learn as much as I could. Judy Charlotte, who's uh, 96 years old, she lives in my village here. She's still around. She may not get around, but she is still around. And through her, uh, maybe 15 years ago, she told me a story. In 1928, uh, she was uh, barely uh, eight years old, maybe nine years old at that time, when the epidemic was happening here from Fort Resolution to this way. And she was traveling with her father and family from Fort Resolution through Gold Cap, which is about 60 kilometers out of here. Gold Cap, there was a village called Sikunke. Many people lived there. And uh, there was a sickness going around. Many people were dying over in that village. And then they decided to come to Tate Chu, which is another village about eight miles from here. And they wanted to come visit the villages and go to that old village where their remaining families were. As, her, as she traveled with her father, she was probably eight and nine years old. They went from village to village and all they saw was loose dogs and people lying all over the, on the rocks, uh, outside of their log, log houses, all over the place. And people were dying. And uh, the sled dogs were all let loose because if the people died, then the sled dogs were, were probably all uh, died too. So they were let loose and people were burying each other. As she went from village to village, one village that uh, they went to, uh, her father told her, stay in the boat, don't get out. You might catch this uh, disease, whatever it is. They had no idea what it was, but they know a lot of people were dying at that time. And as her father went around the old village and uh, he was coming back and he was said, there's no one survived here, everyone's gone except for the dogs. And he was walking back to the boat and Judy heard a young child, baby crying, and told her father, I heard a baby crying, is it? No, no, he said, that's all the dogs are loose. And probably the dogs are probably fighting each other. He said, no, I heard it, I heard a baby, he said. So she got off the boat and she led her father to where she thought she heard the baby in the middle of this grass, surrounded by four or five dogs who were trying, probably protecting the baby, uh, there was a, a two-year-old baby that was crawling around. And inside the cabin was her mother and uh, other family members. There was no one around. 
the uh, all persons in that village passed away except for that two-year-old baby and that uh, Judy uh, uh, found. And it was lucky that she found the baby because that baby was probably never lasted more than silver days, you know. Uh, she probably would have passed away too. But they took that baby and managed to save that baby. And that baby grew up in the village to, to become an elder and he was saved. But he has no memory of his parents or families because he was just a young, young child himself. And at the same time, uh, when Judy and his family were going from village to village to find out who was uh, alive, there was a, a, a white person, I don't know who it is, maybe from Hudson Bay, but there was a, a, an RSMP and a white person uh, with a boat, York boat. They were also going from village to village. So when the uh, RSMP and the other person uh, caught up to them at one village, and they all investigated one village and there was no one alive. So the RSMP took the rifles from the building, uh, all the all the lock houses, threw all the rifles into the water. And he took all the nets and they cut it all up and burned the nets. So I asked Trudy, what was the RSMP doing, burning the rifle and, and cutting up the... Uh, while throwing the rifle in the water and burning the, uh, the nets. These are tools that you need to survive with. You can never survive without them. And if the RSMP was doing something to allow people to continue to get sick and disappear, this is what the kind of action a person does. You know, if you're trying to save the person, you leave the rifles there, you leave the nets so, so that they can defend themselves. So right in my own mind, I started thinking, oh boy, this, this is not good. If Judy is telling me this, and it's true, then they weren't really trying to save people, were they? They weren't trying to save people. They were, they were allowing people to continue to get sick and maybe disappear. You have to remember that this land is valuable. It has many resources, and Canada really wants this land, and how they're going to get it. Are they going to bring medicines to help these people? Maybe not. By, by 1927, uh, my father was born, uh, just uh, uh, a year before the, the big epidemic. Uh, flu, in, in, uh, flu in, I think they call it the Spanish flu. But my father was born 1927, and my grandmother passed away in 1930, 30, uh, 31. Uh, so my father was four years old. He lost 10 of his brothers and sisters. His mom passed away. He was four years old. And just my grandfather and my dad were the only two survivors of that whole family. And so they, uh, they, they left the area and they went to Lac de Gras where the diamond mines are with a man named uh, Moise Benaya from the Benaya family here. And there they spent... Uh, close to silver years. As my grandfather said, I spent over two years with your father. You know, he was only four years old. I took him uh, far into the bear land. I didn't want to lose him. So I, I did everything I could to save him. So they survived. So when years later, when they came back to this place, Sir Yellowknot Bay, and they tried to find their remaining family members and other tribal members, and they found that that the people, many, many, many people perish and only a, a few hundred people survive out of thousands of people, over 7,000 people. So if you go to my community around Yellowknife, Yellowknife Bay here, you're gonna find graveyard, graveyard, graveyards, graveyards, islands, graveyards, mainland graveyards, further out graveyards, there's graveyards everywhere. Those are not really how a community lives. Community lives, they have a cemetery and they're buried off the land. But there was so many crosses and burials on the islands, all within the, the short time frame, then something horrific happened here. Something big happened here. And we know the story. As the elders, then we know the story of what happened. We share that story with our el other elders. We share the story with our schools. What we want to do is we want our families and other Dene people and not indigenous people to know what happened to us because Canada is not going to talk about it. 
Canada is not going to say anything. The priests are not going to say anything. They know uh, they've been, they, they, they uh, came very close to a residential school lawsuit. You know, they don't want to be probably involved in something, another thing, you know, that, uh, that horrifically uh, took the lives of many, many, not thousands, but hundreds of thousands of people. It went all the way from Alberta, right to uh, Fort Smith, Death Cha, Shutsuke, Mackenzie River, Death Cho, Kinchon, Satu, uh, Kuglak Tak, Copper Mine, and Newick. It just went all over. And, and many people talk about it. I went, my wife is from Delaney, and the old people in Delaney talk about the epidemic. It went through there too as well. It went right up to uh, Mackenzie River as far as the Arctic circles, further into the Arctic coast, including the Nunavut people. Pe people from the Nunavut and the coast were also got affected in Kuglaktak, Palatak, and Nuvek. You know, it just, Churchill, it just went all over. <coughs> so 1928 was the worst one, and, and it continued, continued years after people were still dying. Father, Father Brainet, on behalf of Chief Dragies here, uh, told Ottawa, told the priests, we just had a treaty here in 1900. And then in uh, 1920, we had a renegotiated treaty. And in that treaty, uh, Ottawa, Canada, supposed to come to us and give us the medicines that we required because it was part of the agreement. The Queen's people are going to come into our country. And because of that, we need to be protected in Canada under the treaty, Canada negotiated that the medicine box will be available to us should their own Crown subjects bring uh, issues up here that could really affect the indigenous people here because they, the indigenous people have no way of defending themselves in any way. Father Brain had wrote a letter that I read 1937 that I found in an archive. And that letter says, and I have it in my memory very clearly because I read it uh, quite a few times. He writes a letter to Prime Minister in Ottawa. Dear Prime Minister, I call on you, I write this letter from the uh, country of the Indians people here in the north who made treaty many with you many, many years ago. And these people today are in need of your help. They ask you to bring their medicines to them as their people are all dying all over this country. They request you as a prime minister to bring medicines as quickly as you can. The people, that Indian people here require you to do it under the treaty that was made and promised to them many, many years ago. Uh, I, uh, pre I, the priest, Father Brainet, write this letter on behalf of the chiefs, the Northern chiefs here, for their request to you. And that was a letter that was sent to them. So 1928 epidemic, 1927 took place. 10 years later, the medicine still never arrived here. So the priest writes a letter in 1937 and the epidemic was still around by 1940. By mid, uh, late 1940s, it probably disappeared. By then, it was too late for the medicines to arrive because the Yellow Knives uh, by as my grandfather said, when they came back, there was only a handful, a few hundred people alive. I was born in 1957 in this Yellow Knife Bay here, and I grew up in Dera. And I always see all these graveyards hunting with my parents on, on the land. I see cribbers, I see crosses all the time. And I never ask a question. And to me, one day I, I asked my father, why all those crosses and graveyards all across the land? He said, those are people that died in the epidemic, the great, great disease that came here. They were helpless and many, many people died. So by 1950, you know, they Yellow Knives, my own village people, it was only less than 500 people probably. And when I was like six years old, I'm looking at Deda and all the people. I thought we were the only people on this earth and there's no one else. Until uh, I, my father went to the trading post and I saw a white man for the first time. 
And I've seen priests before, but I was afraid of them. But then, and I went to residential school many years later, and then I found out we're not the only one in this world. There's other people too. And throughout the residential school, I find the colonial settlers to be very extreme. Uh, what you can say is that they were trying to be more superior than indigenous people. The indigenous people were gathered up and put on, on barges and shipped to Fort Resolution, 1860s, 1870s, taken away from their families. And many of the parents were crying, as uh, Judy Charlotte was telling me. And that's how forceful Canada was, the colonial settlers who took children. Imagine yourself, uh, myself, going up to the city here. I'm going to tell them not our original children. I'm going to take your children away from you. Our chief and council are going to do it. We're going to take your children away. We're going to teach them to our culture camp, teach them our language, our way of life. And we're going to take your children away. Well, the RSMP will come. Canadian government will come. Everyone will come to the rescue. That didn't happen for us. We were practically uh, uh, torn from our parents' hands and taken away forcefully with the help of priests for all people, you know, who were supposed to be loving and helping people, but they were also working for somebody else. They weren't working for us. So today, there's no priest in our village in Dera. There's no priest in uh, Dilon. We are going back to our drums. We're going back to our own spiritual beliefs because our own spiritual belief, as my grandfather says, when it's our time to go, our families are all waiting for us. They're all standing there, waiting for us to accept us into another world, into another journey. The journey never ends, my grandson. The journey always continues. When your time comes, I'm gonna be waiting for you. Never be afraid. So when my dad passed away in 1994, he told me the same thing. I'll be waiting. But, you know, go enjoy your life. Live a long life, but enjoy it. Even though many bad things might have happened to our people, you know, the herd is still there. So what they're trying to tell me is that, you know, uh, the religion and uh, other things that were taught to us by the colonial settlers, including the priests, was not all true. You know, as my grandfather said, there's no hell. There's no place like hell, uh, nothing. There's nothing like that. No one will do anything like that, you know? When once you passed on, you know, you're, you're, you're living a spiritual world. All your ancestors, all your families will, will welcome you. When you go, they will wait for you. As a medicine man in my village here in the last uh, five years ago, an elder was passing away. And uh, the elder communicate with the spirit. The elder who was passing away, her best friend passed away 10 years before her. She was an elder. And she communicated through this old man and said, I'm waiting for my best friend to, to, uh, to arrive. She is going to go soon. And uh, all our families and friends were all waiting for her. Why is it taking so long for her to come? This elder was passing on her deathbed at the hospital and the friend communicate. So the spiritual world is there. When the world goes, when your time is goes, your families, all your families, all everyone will be there to, to welcome you into your next journey. So my grandfather, as I always said, when I go hunting and trapping and I do religious beliefs, you know, a little prayer for my grandfather. And I always say, my grandfather would never lie to me. There is a spiritual world. There is no fire. There is a happy place. And then you go on to your next journey. That's, that's the book that's never been written. But the other book that's written was to bring fear to you and take control of you so that other followers could come and acquire your land illegally and take position of all of your property, including ownership over you as a state government. And those things I, I don't believe. As indigenous people, we are free people. We are sovereign and we have Aboriginal title to North America, all this land. And Canada knows it, but 
today we're, we're trying to get reconciliation working with them, you know. When one party does something bad and they don't want to go back into history to fix it, they would rather do reconciliation. I'm sorry for all the wrong paths. I'm done. Goodbye. Let's get it over with. That's reconciliation from Ottawa. But that's not the real conciliation. Reconciliation is giving back their property back to indigenous people, giving back their indigenous beliefs. All their cultural artifacts in 1946 that was taken from Ottawa illegally for practicing their own ceremony should all be returned. Many things were, were done wrong. Reconcil reconciliation is a very small word, but in the view of indigenous people, it's a big world. We want it all back, everything that was taken from us. And that's what colonial settlers did to indigenous people here. You know, really affected their lives from illness to epidemic to acquiring land to colonial settlers to forceful. Many bad things happen. But, you know, indigenous people, we, in our heart, we still cry. But and when we talk in, in politics, we're very strong. Because when you feel the pain, you can fight harder. And when the pain is there, you can speak harder. And when you feel the pain, you can be a better person tomorrow, a strong indigenous person. And that's what we're all about. Continue to be strong. Never let anyone control you or tell you what to do. You are free, free people as indigenous people. Right now we're going through this COVID-19 and Canada is doing the same thing, uh, taking control. But they are doing the right thing today by uh, advising, supporting and helping. But that was not there in 1928. It took 15 years for Ottawa to bring the medicines here in 1928, you know, 15 years. But now, you know, things are faster because, things are faster today because the world is watching now. The world is watching Canada, how they behave. They can never get away with it again. So they're trying to do their best to, to do what they can to help all indigenous and non-indigenous in this country. They're trying to do what they can. But as indigenous, you know, we still have that grief. We still have that hurt. We still have that loss of property. We still feel that this is our country and we want to continue to be free. We need to feel good about all things. We haven't felt good about all things in the past, you know. We need to move forward on that. And that's my message to you all. Let's see. Merci, Fred. Um, so you talked about that very, very traumatic experience, so huge loss from the, the Spanish flu epidemic and how the government really used that against Dene people by not getting that medicine box there for almost 20 years. What do you have, what should our communities be doing now in COVID-19 to make sure that, uh, that we're safe and that we're well? Well, we do have a, we do have a treaty and agreements with Canada called the Medicine Chest Healthcare. In Canada, because we, we've gone through this COVID-19, we've learned that those kind of diseases still, can still come today, even in modern times. And it could happen again, numerous times in the future. But I think that governments, because of the treaties and agreements, they should try to set up a healthcare centers in every indigenous community, because some communities don't have it, and they are crying out for help. Uh, when, what, what does a, a, a person do in a small community of 200 people and no nurse, there's no emergency health center and COVID-19 comes in? There's nothing they can do. But now Canada wants a good relationship with indigenous people in this country. Maybe health care is probably a big, big thing. And I truly believe that they should set up uh, health care centers in every indigenous community across uh, North America. So if these things happen in the future, indigenous people will be ready. We will never have to wait 15 years to get our medicines. It should be read in our hands and ready to, to assess it when we really need it. 
And I think that's what Canada should do. One of the things you said was that your, uh, your grandfather took your dad when they were the only survivors of the sickness. They took him to the barren lands. They went back on the land to get healthy. What do you think, why is the land important then during COVID-19? The land is important because the land is fresh. Everything is fresh. And if you stay in an infested mall, like any city with a mall, there's nothing good about it. There's no clean air. You go to the forest, it's all natural, clean, healthy. And if there's COVID or any other disease, you go to the, the forest, the medicines are there. Our traditional medicines are there. We can help ourselves. We can help ourselves by feeding ourselves, eating the right healthy food, getting the right medicines off the forest, drinking the healthy water, you know. So for one stays away from this area, you can be uh, free from uh, any sickness. And that's what my grandfather did. He knew what to do at that time. If he stayed here, it would have been lost for him and his son, the only two survivors of a, a family of uh, 13 people. They were the only two people. And he knew what to do. He took his son to the bear land where there's no one, no uh, colonial settlers there. There's no non-Aboriginal people out there. And it's a wild open country. Him and his friend, uh, Moise Benaya, another indigenous person, they went to the bear lands and stayed there for many, many years. And I think that's that's how he survived. My father never caught the uh, never caught the uh, uh, Spanish flu. Uh, they were living off the uh, the land. They were eating uh, healthy food. They were drinking healthy uh, uh, water. Medicine plants were great, and I think he survived all that. When he came back years later, many of the family members were gone, and uh, there was few survivors. He was one, him and his son were the only few survivors of his family with uh, other few hundred other yellow knives from a village that survived too. So right from the city of yellow knife, right to Bechoko and Fort Ray, there's graveyards all along the shorelines. And from yellow knife going east, which is uh, 200 miles east into the Arctic tundra, all along the shoreline, there's graveyards all the way uh, to the east arm and you can see them visibly. So what we do uh, every, uh, from time to time, we take a white paint and we paint all those cribbings so that other people that come into a country could see it. These are the evidence of uh, Spanish flu that our people caught and we had no medicines to defend ourselves. And that's why our, our people died horribly. And here's one graveyard, here's another one, here's another one. These are the signs that epidemic that came and took the lives of many, many people. And uh, the ones that survived, like myself here, are the only voices that we have to try to educate other people, the voices that, that talk about the, uh, the stories of the past that was really, really horribly wrong. And that I hope that uh, it won't happen again. The epidemic, COVID-19, is all over the world now. And it hasn't reached our village or our communities yet. I think the indigenous people did the right thing by closing their doors as, as soon as they can because they learned from 1928 this could happen again. And with the help of uh, government Norris territory and other health professionals, close up the borders, the airlines, and we did the right thing. So we are kind of COVID free here in the north. We're trying to keep it that way. Although we do see license plates uh, from Nova Scotia, license plates from Alberta, BC, in Yellowknife already, and I don't know how they got through. So we're trying to be very careful uh, at, at shopping stores and different places. Myself, my family, we stay in my house and only one or two persons shops. We don't all go to the store. We try not to do that. We don't, we don't try to visit our family. Even though we miss our families, our friends, it's really hard to visit people, you know? So we use the phone and uh, computer and laptops and other things to try to communicate with uh, our family members, see how they're doing, see if they're, they've got enough food, see if they're doing very well, you know. So we check on each other. And so far, everything's been good so far.
and I'm happy that that's the way it is. I hope that it will continue. Do you think that the land is trying to teach us something right now with this big sickness about the way that we've been living? The old people, long time and people before the colonial settlers come to this country, the indigenous people had no known sickness, disease, nothing. They were disease free. And they used the wilderness, the plants and the medicines to look after and heal themselves. It worked well for them. So they had no disease. There was no such thing as cold. As the old people, many, many of them have told me that nobody ever got sick before in the past, hundreds of years ago, before the colonial settlers came here. There was no such thing as sickness. It was healthy. People were eating well. They had medicines. They had healers, they had doctors, all those people that took care of them, people that knew plants well, people that knew how to take care of other people. They had midwives, children were born on the land with their natural plants and medicines. So right from birth, you know, they were very healthy. Uh, I think that went wrong was uh, when the colonial settlers started to come out and open with the priests and start to explore the land uh, for mostly for minerals and gold. And uh, that really devastated people. And that's how the Spanish flu went, went around the territory really fast because there was people all over. They knew they had Spanish flu, but they still came into the country here and they affected the indigenous people here. And that was, uh, <laughs> that was not a good thing. When one person is, is sick, you know, they should have went back but they continue to go north. You know, gold, uh, gold is a fool's gold. You know, gold is attractive. Gold drives people crazy. And I always tell my children, you know, there's two things that makes a person, colonial settlers eyes open wide. One, you tell them a joke, they'll open their eyes wide and laugh. The other one is when they see a gold, the eyes open really wide. Those are the two things. And that's, that's what they really devastated us is gold minerals. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your uh, your wisdom and your knowledge uh, with us. Um, I'm hoping that they would probably find the right medicines. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're searching. But I can tell you that as indigenous people in the north here, we're also looking at our own medicines too as well. Yeah. We're trying to go back to discover our own medicines that we haven't used in the past and try to work with it today. You know, something has to happen. What worked for us in the past, you know, worked for us. It may not be the real uh, medicines, but at least we can find something that will hold us off and, and heal us a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, um, our Anishinaabe elders are saying that too, that our healers and our medicine people are working really hard right now to try to find uh, medicines that work for COVID. Yeah. yeah. 